Hello and welcome to Spotlight from Washington, D.C., where in this St. Patrick's week, attention is once again sharply focused on Northern Ireland. Unionists, nationalists, Republicans and representatives from London and Dublin are in town seeking open doors and willing ears. But for the Sinn Féin President Gerry Adams, it's all very different from last year. President Clinton is keeping the White House doors firmly closed and the pressures on Republicans to have the IRA ceasefire restored. Stephen Walker examines the altered mood of Irish America. Tell me, okay, tell me, how about a shake with the judge? Even man's best friend wants to be Irish in the run-up to St. Patrick's Day. In Alexandria, this year's celebrations have a distinctive canine feel to them. Putting on a show is something this wealthy suburb of Washington does rather well. The celebrations aren't just for the Irish, and early March in Alexandria is an all-American affair. The Irish community make a proud boast. Since 1980, they've been running the country's first St. Patrick's Parade of the Year. Last Saturday, thousands of Alexandrians remembered Ireland's patron saint eight days before the rest of the country. Even though the mood was upbeat, amidst the celebrations, there was a serious message. In Alexandria's most famous Irish bar, thoughts this year have turned to home. You'll see many people wearing the white ribbons, and that is for peace in Northern Ireland. We are concerned, we care, and we know there will be peace. We will wear the white ribbons, and these bulls will hang in here until peace has been restored. Pat Troy, a publican from County Mayo, has organised every single St. Patrick's Day parade in Alexandria. A month after the collapse of the IRA ceasefire, he believes this year's celebrations are a little muted. This time last year we were in the peace process. Uh, this year there's a little bit of down and sadness, and I think it's all the more reason why we're more determined to get up and keep that peace process going and, and, and make it happen and continue the peace process. But do people here think the peace process is finished? No, no. We're very optimistic. And everybody, there's an awful lot of people now concerned that were never concerned before. They didn't even care what was going back on in Ireland. And with the, the peace, with the, the lives being spared and no one getting hurt or killed, both Protestants and Catholics, what a great feeling. And there's an awareness now that has never been here in this country. One group typical of the dozens of Irish-American families enjoying a night out are the Vauses. Jim and Mary Kay and their daughter Megan are regular St. Patrick's Day goers. At seven, Megan is a prize-winning Irish dancer, a talent encouraged by her parents, keen to pass on their ancestry, which has its roots in 1920s Ireland. Mary Kay's grandmother came from County Sligo and her grandfather from Armagh. A member of the old IRA, he emigrated to America to avoid arrest. Seventy years later, his descendants can be found in this affluent area of Fairfax, half an hour's drive from Alexandria. The Vauses, who both serve in the US Army, believe it's important to keep their ancestry alive. Their interest in Irish affairs isn't solely confined to culture. They keep a close eye on political affairs. We believe that there ought to be a peace, an lasting peace, um, and that violence is not necessarily the way to achieve that peace. Ultimately, what would you like to see happen in Ireland? I'd like to see a united Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland, you know, one Ireland, not a Northern Ireland and then Ireland. I'd like to see one united country. And would you like to see um, the British leave Northern Ireland? I would like to see the British rule leave Northern Ireland, yes. On the other side of Fairfax County, the Barco family are on their way to morning service. Officially, the Barcos are part of the 44 million strong lobby who call themselves Irish American. But like many other Protestants in the United States, 
They preferred to see their ancestry as Ulster Scots. A former naval officer, Hap Barco became interested in Ireland when he heard Ian Paisley preach 25 years ago. His wife, Margaret, shares his views and both feel the unionist message has been largely ignored on their side of the Atlantic. I look at some of the greatest men in our country, some of our presidents, uh, some of the men who forged uh, trails across this nation, and uh, some of the men who fought uh, in, in, in our wars, and uh, many of them came from uh, Scotch-Irish uh, descent. Uh, my own family uh, were, were uh, Scottish, settled in Ulster County, uh, came over here from Belfast in uh, the late 1800s, and um, they were pioneers. They were what made this country great, and it grieves me uh, severely to uh, see uh, in this country the issues just uh, washed over and uh, short shrift given to uh, some of the, uh, the, the seriousness of uh, the conflict over there. I think there's not enough attention given to um, to the, the folks in Northern Ireland in the sense that all the talk is more of, of IRA and, 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 and what can we do to get these people to um, come to some agreement, but um, oftentimes the will of the people in Northern Ireland, Ireland seems to be overlooked or not um, um, important. Good afternoon, Ulster Unionist Party. If the unionist cause is being overlooked, one woman trying to reverse that is Washington-based political activist Anne Smith. Uh, we start the day with a 9 a.m. press briefing at the National Press Club. And uh, Mr. Trimble will talk about the status of the Northern Ireland peace process. This week, her phone hasn't stopped ringing because an Ulster unionist team is in town. The message I'm trying to portray is to let Americans know that the, the situation at present in Northern Ireland, where it's part of the United Kingdom, is what the majority of the people of Northern Ireland want and what they consistently vote for time after time. What do you think the visit of Mr. Trimble and, and Mr. Taylor this week will achieve? I think the visit of uh, Mr. Trimble and Mr. Taylor this week uh, will achieve um, the purpose of showing that they're willing to come out and meet with people, that they're not retreating behind the barriers as they've been accused of doing many times in the past, and especially with the current situation uh, of uh, there having been a return to violence by the IRA, that they're not in hiding from anything, that they're more than willing to come out and meet with people and talk with them. This is the image the Ulster Unionists are out to counter. Within hours of his arrival in New York, Jerry Adams was at a party rally. Everywhere the Sinn Féin leader goes, the American media follows. But this visit is not without its difficulties for Republicans. The trip itself is very different to last year's. Because the IRA ceasefire was broken, Jerry Adams isn't welcome at the White House. And his visa was only granted on the understanding that he wouldn't become involved in fundraising. The issue of Jerry Adams' visa hasn't just bothered those who are sympathetic to unionism. What's interesting this time about his visit is that previously supportive Irish Americans are now distancing themselves from the Sinn Féin leader. Some in the Irish community feel let down because the ceasefire has been broken. And the Sinn Féin is away, rough for the dead, the America's ever-increasing Irish community has traditionally backed calls for a united Ireland. But they've always been divided on the best ways to achieve that. The arrival of Gerry Adams one month after the collapse of the ceasefire has heightened those differences. I don't think Bill Clinton, President Clinton, should have invited Gerry Adams into this country or granted him a visa to be here. Our country has a history of not allowing people with questionable or shameful pasts into this country. Gerry Adams is, is a fine spokesman for the cause, and time was overdue in America to allow him here. Uh, this is the land of the free, and we should hear all sides. Is it right that Gerry Adams was granted a visa to the States? I think it was, um, particularly from President Clinton's point of view, because he has a lot of Irish American support, and I think a lot of Irish Americans would have uh, quit supporting him if he hadn't done that. Thanks for coming. Good to have you all. Take care. Good to have you all. Thanks for coming. But there are other Irish Americans who believe President Clinton's made a mistake. I fear that uh, 
his condoning Mr. Adams' uh, visit um, may be sending the wrong signals to our allies in uh, both Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland, that we're willing to uh, embrace a man with uh, not that clean of uh, a record, a clear of a character, uh, and it appears to be, to me, to be a snub in the face of, um, again, our allies. <laughs> So will the Adams visit upset Anglo-American relations? The Vaughs family believe it's right that Jerry Adams was invited, and they think his visit will improve transatlantic links. We have not discriminated against other individuals visiting this country who have um, maybe some not so favorable things about them also. And um, I think it was an effort um, like almost a good faith effort, you know, that yes, indeed, he was going to work towards a peace process. And I think that's why now he's persona non grata at the White House because of the recent bombings. From NBC News, this is NBC Nightly News, reported by Giselle Fernandez. A boost today for peace in Northern Ireland. A year ago, it was so different. Last March, Jerry Adams was fated as a peacemaker and enjoyed St. Patrick's Day in the company of the president. This year, he's not been invited. Instead, other local politicians will enjoy the limelight. Seasoned Washington observers accept the visa issue caused President Clinton concern. But they think it's wrong to suggest that the White House no longer sees Jerry Adams as a key player in the peace process. The administration has taken the same line as the Dublin and London governments. They say that as long as the ceasefire does not uh, or is not uh, in place, they will not formally uh, have Jerry Adams in the White House. But that doesn't mean to say that they're cold shouldering or have broken off contacts. I think one of the crucial points to be remembered is that the administration is still dealing with Jerry Adams. Uh, they haven't. Uh, they said before he came here that they would not rule out a meeting off campus, so to speak, with Jerry Adams to discuss uh, his continuing role in the peace process. And it's very important for them to have somebody like Jerry Adams who may deliver another IRA ceasefire as he has done before. It must be an embarrassment to your party to find him being cold-shouldered by the American authorities. Well, we don't find him cold shouldered, and certainly myself and my role here, I haven't really had any cold shoulder. I think people um, have an opinion. What's most prevalent here is the goodwill from people of all persuasions for peace in Ireland. People want to see a uh, negotiated peace settlement, and there's still enthusiasm for that. But he's not going to meet the president, so that's a cold shoulder. Well, he's not meeting the president, and that's unfortunate, but he's met the president before. Uh, he certainly will meet the president again. He will be meeting Senator Dodd. Uh, he'll be meeting the co-chairs of the Ad Hoc, uh, Friends of Ireland, other members of Congress. He will also be attending uh, events in New York City. And he will be meeting a lot of prestigious individuals. And what will be most important is the welcome that he will receive from Irish America. It's clear many in the Irish community still have a high regard for the Sinn Féin president. And despite the break in the ceasefire, believe Jerry Adams has an important role to play. One of those people is Congressman Jim Moran. He was due to meet Jerry Adams today. I, I don't think it's up to Jerry Adams to deliver a ceasefire. I don't think he really is able to do that. He, uh, 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 there are a lot of radical folk within the IRA, and he doesn't have control over all of them. It's not dis, uh, dissimilar to what's happening in the Mideast. You know, Arafat doesn't have control of all the Palestinians. You've got a lot of radical people. Uh, but, but at least Jerry Adams is able to articulate a vision for the future. And that vision for the future needs to be brought to the peace table. And I do think he has more influence over the radicals than, uh, than any other public figure that, uh, that you or I could think of today. Throughout Washington this week, there are a multitude of St. Patrick's Day events and invitations have been issued to the many visitors from home. But with British and Irish politicians still ruling out face-to-face -face talks with Sinn Féin, event organizers know careful choreography is required. For many Irish Americans in Washington, one of the highlights of the week will be tonight's gala dinner for the American Ireland Fund. Officially, Jerry Adams hasn't been invited, but he will be brought along by other guests and will sit in the same room as the Ulster Unionists and other British and Irish politicians. The Unionist delegation hopes this trip will open doors they once believed were closed. 
David Trimble's reason for coming appears to be twofold, to remind America of the Unionist position and to counter what he sees as nationalist propaganda. So why exactly has Jerry Adams come to Washington if he's being excluded from the White House and key St. Patrick's Day events? The one thing that Jerry Adams has to sell to the IRA, uh, which might swing it in his favor, is that uh, President Clinton has said that he is prepared to guarantee and so far as the administration can, that the all-party talks will take place as committed by the British and Irish governments on the 10th of June, which is the key demand of the Republican movement. So it's important for him to come over here to talk to Irish Americans about that, uh, to hear from them too, and this, the White House is very keen that this should be the case, uh, of how much the Irish Americans want the peace process back on track and for him to bring that message back to Belfast. There is clear optimism amongst leading politicians on Capitol Hill that Gerry Adams' visit could lead to a second IRA ceasefire. Congressman Richard Neal meets the Sinn Féin leader every time he comes to Washington. He believes it is possible this year's trip could prove fruitful, but only if politicians are imaginative. It's important to remember that the ceasefire had some success because of the risks that Bill Clinton was willing to take. And I don't think that Bill Clinton could have just, in this instance, turned the other cheek and said, well, I tried and, and it didn't work. I think that Bill Clinton's position had to be, I tried, it worked, then it didn't work. Let's try to make it work again. Let's begin to roll the boulder back up the hill. There's clear consensus on Capitol Hill about the president's handling of Irish affairs. Even Republicans like Peter King have praise for the Democratic administration. Bill Clinton uh, is trying to send a message to the IRA. Basically, he's showing that he's giving Jerry Adams the visa. I'm sure members of the administration will be meeting with Jerry Adams, that uh, Bill Clinton wants Jerry Adams to stay in as part of the process. But on the other hand, he wants the IRA to know that for Sinn Féin to become a full member of the all-party talks, the IRA has to call a ceasefire. I mean, the IRA should know that there's virtually no one in this country, no matter how strongly they may have supported the Republican movement in the past, is in any way supporting what the IRA is doing right now. The IRA must call a ceasefire. This is President Clinton's way of sending a message to the IRA. At the same time, though, he's keeping in contact, obviously, with Jerry Adams, and making it clear that the United States considers Jerry Adams to be an honorable person who is a key player in the peace process. Earlier this week, Irish Americans praised Bill Clinton for his role in Ireland. Many believe his administration has done more than any other. And in an election year, he's aware of how important 44 million Irish Americans are. But he's conscious, too, that if another ceasefire can be brokered, success could bring more than votes. The people of Northern Ireland have clearly chosen peace. They have chosen dialogue over division. They do not deserve to have a small group choose bloodshed and violence and shatter their dreams. And we must not allow those who have been hardened by the past to hijack the future of the children of Northern Ireland. Two of those children are in Washington this week. David Sterrett and Catherine Hamill stole the president's heart in Belfast in November when they read him letters for peace. Last weekend, they were in Alexandria for America's first St. Patrick's parade of the year. David and Catherine, they're friends now. I mean, it doesn't matter, they're different religions. I mean, they can play together peacefully and they should be able to grow up together and work together without the animosity that there is at home. So what do you think a visit like this can do overall? I think hopefully it would let the Americans see, you know, sometimes I feel they only see one side of the story and at least if they see, I mean, that the, the children, the adults can be together, we don't have to be shooting them, shouting at each other all the time, we can live peacefully and maybe a wee bit of pressure here and there and our own politicians sitting down and working together. We could have a peace settlement. Behind the shamrocks and the symbolism, there's clearly much talking going on in Washington. So what's likely to emerge once the celebrations are over? Do you think at the end of this whole week of celebration, the peace process could be in any better shape? Well, what will put the peace process in better shape, I think, is a commitment to a negotiated settlement and a commitment to inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness, a commitment to dialogue and a commitment to treating Sinn Féin 
like the other political parties. I think here, what uh, is important about this side of, of the Atlantic is that the American uh, connection in all of this has been very important. The US government has played a positive role, and I'm talking about the president as well as the Congress, and both sides, uh, bipartisan support. Um, so what, what, what we want here is Irish and America to strengthen their voice to push for that negotiated settlement. Uh, if the IRA is going to have another ceasefire, I think one of the factors that may bring it about, and the Americans certainly would like to think that this is the case, uh, is the uh, fact that uh, the American administration, and this is the world's superpower, is interested in saying that there is fair play, that uh, the date for all party talks will be adhered to and that the all party talks get underway. They're almost acting as guarantors. And it's a, an opportunity for Irish Americans to send a message back to uh, Sinn Féin and to the IRA that this is as good as they're going to get forever from the United States and the historical opportunity may not come again. Other Washington insiders like veteran commentator Mary McGrory agree that Irish America has a crucial role, but they believe its significance has been overstated. I think the action is in Ireland. I think it's reached the point where the Irish people have to insist that the ceasefire be renewed. If you saw that film of the president in Ireland, you saw this absolute delirium about the ceasefire and peace and all that. And they're just going to have to insist on it some way or another. I don't know how, but that, to me, is where the solution is. Do you want French fries or coleslaw with your sandwich? Oh, yeah. Pancakes and eggs, please. Scott's Irish families, like the Barcos, think that too much emphasis has been placed on the role of the largely nationalist Irish-American lobby. They believe many from that quarter are being naive, that they think there can be a quick fix for Northern Ireland. We always in this country say you can't mix religion and politics, but uh, throughout history, religion and politics is what makes the world go round, and uh, you, you just can't get away from that. Uh, you, you touch raw nerves when you get in that area, as you well know, and um, I, I think unless we start to deal in good faith uh, and, and require certain things before we get to the table, um, there can't be any trust on either side. I'm going to split a potato with her. Okay. Actually, do you want some salad, Megan? A little, little bit. bit. Yeah. Many Irish Americans, like the Vos family, believe trust and goodwill already exist. The Vos's feel this week could be the right time to make progress. Church. I think it is an opportunity um, to form good relationships. Um, I think it's a good time. Some people think that um, talks can't begin until the IRA decommission and that there is a second ceasefire. Do you agree? Well, <clears throat> I think it's difficult to uh, be in the military and, and having been involved in, you know, what was in Vietnam was a civil war. You don't necessarily ask people. It's hard to say, put down your guns and let's talk. And that's, that's just not human nature, I don't think. I think you can ask them to quieten their guns and then let's talk. And then, you know, dearming people is all, always the most difficult part of, of uh, that process. So should there be a ceasefire before talking? Yes. Stephen Walker reporting. Now, Sinn Féin may be barred from the highest levels of government, but there's no shortage of people willing to listen to Jerry Adams. Since he arrived on Tuesday, he's had a busy round of meetings with members of Congress and newspaper editors, to name just a few. Last night, he appeared on CNN's Larry King Live show. Now, live from Los Angeles, here's Larry King. He's just arrived in New York. He's our first guest tonight. Jerry Adams is president of Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA. He's in town in New York for about five days. What is the reason for this trip, Jerry? Well, I came here uh, on invitation from a large number of people to celebrate St. Patrick's Day here with the Irish and America. And can I start by extending a very, very happy St. Patrick's Day greeting to all our friends here throughout the United States of America. Uh, I, also want, I also want to update people on the peace process. I bring a message of hope 
and a message of peace. We have to get the process back on the tracks and to move the situation on once again. Now, talks are scheduled for when, June 10th? Well, there are all sorts of difficulties and preconditions being placed, but the, the commitment from the two governments uh, is for June 10th, and I'm hopeful that that will be a proper uh, date to move the situation forward. The IRA has claimed responsibility, Jerry, for the latest bombing in London last Friday night and for two others over the last month. What is your statement concerning that? Well, I regret very much that the IRA cessation has ended. You'll recall that I first appeared in your show two years ago. Now, for that two-year period and before it, I and others were working to establish a peace process in my country. Mr. Hume of the SDLP and Mr. Albert Reynolds and people here in Irish America, including your president, all contributed to that situation. And the IRA, as you know, on the 31st of August, declared a complete cessation of military operations. Now, if you can just think back of all the things that you did in that year and a half of a cessation, and if you can realize that the British government never sought to advance, never sought to consolidate, never sought to make the process work, then you get some sense of the very regrettable end of the cessation. And as far as I'm concerned, we have to redouble our efforts in the Middle East when there are breakdowns in South Africa and in other conflict resolution processes. When they broke down, leaders had to dig deep, take risks, and redouble their efforts to put the processes back together again. The last time Jerry Adams appeared on Larry King Live, he sat side by side with the Ulster Unionists' Ken McGuinness. This year, the producers invited David Trimble to share the airtime. I'm told they were surprised when he declined. But Mr. Trimble has had his own round of meetings. David Trimble, what is the message that you're bringing to Washington this week? It's exactly the same as the message I gave to Bill Clinton when I was last in the White House in the beginning of February, that we want the administration and the president to do what he can to support peace and democracy in Northern Ireland. Now, we take the view that the best way forward to support democracy is through elections and the convention leading to the talks. And the latter, the talks, are clearly supported by the administration. On the question of peace, I think the administration is in a position to exert a fair amount of pressure and influence uh, on Irish republicanism. And they have done that already, uh, and I would hope that they would do more of that. And what precisely would that more be? Well, they've, they've started, as you know, to uh, follow the British and Irish governments by denying Sinn Féin uh, direct access to ministers, access to government property. They have restricted their visiting rights to the United States. I think uh, if there is no ceasefire in the short term, the probability is that the administration will then go on to look at things like fundraising and even access to the United States itself. America has made it quite clear it wants the ceasefire restored. Now, if that happened, what would stop you sitting down with Sinn Féin in all party talks on June the 10th? What we will need to know right at the beginning of the proceedings is, are people committed to the Mitchell principles? Are they going to agree to operate and to work and to decommission weapons along the lines of Mitchell? And it might very well be, and this is why I say that we need to discuss this matter with the Secretary of State and others, might very well be that on the 10th of June that people are placed with a very simple question in which they're expected to give a simple, short and unequivocal answer and then having agreed to accept Mitchell to then immediately agree to the things required by Mitchell. That may not take very long. It may be that the test and the date is going to be there as a very stringent test for the paramilitaries because come the 10th of June, they're going to have to come up to the mark very quickly or else. And that's the story so far at Washington, but there's a lot more political action to come this week, and you can catch up with that on Hearts and Minds tomorrow night on BBC Two at half past seven. Join me then on Capitol Hill. For now, I wish you a very good night.